Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Magical Day Radio, the happiest show on the air. Here are your hosts, Don Short and Chris Linden. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Magical Day Radio. This is John, and I'm here with my co-host, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Don. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Great. Well, we're super excited to have this guest with us because um, he's got a bunch of exciting things. We're going to feature a couple of them today here with us. Um, he's got an amazing book. He's the author of Discovering the Magic Kingdom, an unofficial Disneyland vacation guide, and some other stuff that we're going to discuss. Please help us welcome Joshua Schaefer. Hello. Hi, Josh. Hello. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you, Joshua. Welcome. Looks like it's going to be a good day today. Nice to have you aboard, Joshua. This is exciting. I like being on podcasts. <laughs> so we have some questions for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. So Joshua, can you tell us about your history with Disneyland and how um, you started writing about it? Sure. Well, around 2001, I started going as an adult. And I had been about two times in my teens and then once when I was three. But I didn't really remember much about it but in 2001 i went for the first time after saving up my money to go and i loved it it was exciting i went into the park and everything there just reminded me of my childhood so i got a season pass right then and there and i went back a couple times a year and around 2006 i decided to start writing down all of the interesting tidbits i was hearing about disneyland like the fun facts about the attractions like the basketball hoop and the top of the Matterhorn and Walt's apartment above the firehouse. And I started writing them down and taking them with me to the park because then I would share them with other people. Then I started typing them into the computer and printing it out. Then I decided to start actually researching them on purpose. So I started looking them up online. I started getting Disneyland books and I decided I should make this into like a little booklet and then it just ended up turning into a fat book. <laughs> <laughs> so it took four and a half years, and my book was finally published in uh, October 2010. Congratulations. Yeah. It's a great book, and booklet by no means at all. <laughs> it's yeah. fantastic. Well, there's almost a thousand fun facts in it. There's 105 pictures. There's It's 220 pages long. They just I try to touch on as many subjects as I can. But my main priority was the fun facts, which start on page 126. So what inspired you to write this as a book and publish it? Well, I like to answer people's questions. People call me at work. They come up to me to ask me stuff about anything, but a lot of Disney stuff. And I, that's why I decided I'm just going to put this stuff in a book so that everybody can learn this stuff because the information is out there, but it's in all sorts of different places. Like you have to read through several books or find podcasts or interviews of Imagineers or blogs. And I just got it all and put it in one spot. And I just wanted it so that people could learn as much as they could. Cause I like to collect things and I collected the fun facts and put them in one spot. What was your favorite chapter to work on? Oh, gosh. Um, within the fun facts itself, for the attractions, I liked writing about Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion. Okay. Because there's so much history with those two attractions, because they were huge attractions, and they were the last things that Walt worked on before yeah. he died. So there's just so much for them out there. Where Some of the attractions, I only have like a page worth of stuff, but... Pirates and Haunted Mansion take up about 20 pages or so. So does basically every attraction have a section devoted to its history? Yeah. And yes. Every existing attraction does. Um, now, because it did come out in 2010, Captain EO is in there, um, which is no longer there in the park. Um, I don't have Radiator Springs Racers because that, that hadn't opened yet. I did talk about Cars Land being built in like the amount of money and time that was going to be spent doing it and the the rebooting of California Adventure. Like I talked about it, but none of the attractions had opened yet. So I didn't know any details 
at that time. Right. Um, actually, right before I sent out my PDF to my publisher, they closed Honey, I Shrunk the Audience and reopened Captain EO. And I was like, no, I just finished writing about <laughs> Honey, I Shrunk the Audience and I had to delete it and find information about Captain EO because I didn't know anything about it because it closed back when I was a little kid. Mm. So it was like a scramble to get that information together. Yeah, I just, it's just a lot of stuff. It's just a lot of stuff. Even small things like the petting zoo has its own section, which now that's gone. Right. Yeah. Um, I do have a section in the back called Attractions of the Past, and it lists every single attraction that existed in Disneyland when it opened and when it closed. And some of them have like a brief overview of what they were or why they closed. Hmm. Wow. So do you plan on doing a, a new version of the book? I I do. I have been working on oh. the second edition. Um, it's just it's been taking a long time because I there's so many yeah. because of getting feedback over the past couple years from people. Of, this should be in the book, or you should have more <laughs> of this. I, it's there's a lot more research that's going into it. I got a lot more books than I did before, and mm -hmm. and it's gonna be bigger than the first one. But I don't know how far along it is like <laughs> it keeps getting yeah. bigger and i don't know when i'm going to be able to stop and have it published <laughs> and they keep adding more and more to the park yeah. like Star exactly Wars land and yeah. all things that are changing constantly it's it's hard to keep up with disneyland these days yeah. well so i had originally tried to have it released for last year and if i had i never would have found out if the hat box ghost wasn't there mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. the react him then I decided I needed to I needed to boost up my movie fun facts section because I have a whole section for the movie fun facts, and I've just been working on that. I wrote fifty four mini biographies for Imagineers and people who had wow. put stuff into the park and voice actors and whatnot. So it was a lot of extra stuff that I'm putting together. It's just very time consuming, and I'm not doing it all the time. Like the right. mini biographies, I spent at least a year writing, and it was just those. Mm -hmm. Oh my word! It, it gets a little tiring after a while. <laughs> How many pages is the book? The current, um, book. The current one is two hundred and twenty pages. Oh. Um, I don't know the second one yet. I'll probably like be double. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Well, and with my new publisher, it's going to be a smaller dimensions book. Like the, oh, it's okay. going to be shorter, and it's going to be smaller, which means it'll extend out and be thicker. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I can't compare it page right, right. or wise because it'll be longer anyway. Because mm -hmm. the so, pages will be smaller dimension. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely have to have you back again. Um, yeah. To talk about that when the time comes. Definitely. How long did it take you to complete the book? Uh, four and a half years or so. So it's around, it's sometime in 2006 when I had started and then it published October 2010. My word. Yeah, it was a lot. I spent was... more time writing it then than I do the second one now. Just because I had more time then. I just I have a lot of things on my plate right now. Yeah. So it's more of your, your hobby than your main <laughs> it's what you do yes. in your downtime. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I I love movies. Every Thursday night I go to the movie premieres mm -hmm. in my local theater and I have a movie theater in my house. I can seat 21 people. I have an eight foot screen. I have a snack wow. bar. I have oh a my regular goodness. bar. Um, How fun. Are you? Yeah. Well, I rent it out for birthday parties and stuff for my friends or their friends. And so maybe two or three Saturdays of every month, I have a party that's in there for four to six hours. So, oh like last gosh. night, there was 18 people here last night. Wow. Full house. They watched the movie. Yeah. And they bring food or cake or whatever. Right. Are you a fan of Disney movies? Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I collect as many movies as I can get my hands on. Yeah. Yeah, I could imagine. My favorite, my favorite series is the Pirates of the Caribbean, though, because it's like if you miss the attraction, oh, I want to go back to Pirates. Oh, let me put mm -hmm. on this movie. It'll, it'll hold me over. Right. It Can't does. Do that. Mansion. Not yet. No. I mean, Guillermo del Toro was working yeah. on the film, so. But he's been working on it for a couple of years, and it keeps the date for it keeps getting pushed out. So we'll see. 
Uh, was there anything new that you learned about Disneyland and putting this book together? Actually, I learned more about the construction of Pirates of the Caribbean. Like, they originally started building it in the early 60s, and they decided they were going to make it two levels, and the Pirate Wax Museum was going to be in the basement below the Blue Bayou. And they had the hole dug, and they had steel and girders put in, and then Walt pulled all of his Imagineers off of that and put them on the World's Fair project so that they okay. could do that stuff. And then they had the World's Fair, and they learned we can get a lot of people through an attraction, like Small World, 3,000 people an hour if we put them in a boat. And then we have this animatronic Abraham Lincoln. What if we made the, the pirates animatronic instead of wax? Well, they can't fit in the basement, but we already built the basement. And then Walt said, tear it all out and build it again. Mm -hmm. And they said, but Walt, mm -hmm. we spent some money doing this. And he said, I don't care. I want it to be the best. But it won't fit because we have to put in a flume for the boat now with water. All right, we'll go outside the berm. But they have holiday land out there. And there's a baseball diamond on the other side of the train tracks. Take out the baseball diamond. So they dug underneath the train tracks and put the show building outside the train track. So when you go through the transition tunnel where you see the fog screen and you see Davy Jones, you're actually underneath the train tracks right there. Uh -huh. And then yeah. come back into the park, you're going through the burning city. And when you go under and they have that chair hanging down, that's about when you're going under the train tracks to come back in. Right. And so they spent extra money to change it around and rebuild it with the, the log flume. Now, Walt did get to see one scene completed for Pirates, and that was the auctioneer scene, but they had it set up in the studio. So they had all the animatronics set up on both sides, and they put Walt in the boat with wooden benches and on wheels, and they pushed him slowly through it, and Walt loved it. And they said, but Walt, there's a sounds coming from all different directions. Like, nobody's going to be able to focus on what's being said. And he said, well, it's like a cocktail party. You have conversations everywhere, but people still choose what they're going to be listening to and involved with. He said it'll make people come back more just so they can hear the other parts of the attractions or look the other direction. And I always suggest that people, when there's sounds coming from one side, look on the other side of the to the other shore because there's stuff on both sides and you miss a lot of things because you have a tendency mm -hmm. to look where the sounds are coming from. And... They decided, all right, we'll do that. We'll have sounds everywhere. And um, on November 2nd, 1966, Walt went in and had his left lung removed because of lung cancer. He had a tumor. And after his short recovery time, because the doctors gave him six months to two years to live, he went back down and he was able to walk through the, the attraction, but it wasn't the animatronics weren't in there yet. And right. there was no water. So he was able to walk through it. And he went back to the studio. And they were showing him pictures for the Country Bear Jamboree. And that was the last thing he had looked at for Disneyland was the Country Bear stuff. And then December 15th, 1966, mm. he, he died. And nobody knew he was what was wrong with him. He told people he had an old um, polo injury that was acting up. But people knew. His family knew the truth but his imagineers didn't and mark davis had said um that walt had said goodbye to him but walt never said goodbye he always said i'll see you later or have a good night he never actually said goodbye but this time he did right he and oh and another thing he had said was they wanted to have a christmas opening for pirates and the imagineers told walt they didn't think it was ready and he said well hold off don't worry about what the the bigwigs want do it when it's done. And so because of that holding off, he didn't actually get to see it completed. Right. So it opened four months after he had passed away. Right. Yeah. Fun facts. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any fun facts about the Haunted Mansion? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Tons of those. <laughs> well, originally there was only two Imagineers put on that project and it was um, Yale Gracie and Raleigh Crump. And Walt put them together and they had never worked together. Raleigh was this new Imagineer. He was the youngest in the department. And for a whole year, it was just the two of them coming up with all these designs and weird things for the Haunted Mansion. And after about a year, Walt pulled them off of that because of the World's Fair. 
and right. revisited it when they came back. And he had gone into the shop because they had put more Imagineers on it after the World's Fair. He went into the shop to look at everything and and Raleigh Crump was over in the corner with his little designs of weird things for what he called <laughs> the of the weird. And he had seen all the Imagineer stuff. He was kind of, he said, it wasn't an outcast Imagineer. He just, he wasn't everybody's favorite because he was the new young kid and his ideas were different. And so they had him over in the back corner and he said, well, what's Raleigh working on? And they're like, oh, he's just got some stuff. So he went over to see Raleigh and he's like, hey, what's going on over here? And Raleigh said, oh, these are all my weird ideas. And he said, what are we going to use them for? And Raleigh's like, I have no idea. <laughs> and he's like, all right, well, let me think about this. So that night, um, Raleigh went home. The next day he came back and Walt was sitting at his desk in the same clothes he was wearing the night before. Walt said, I could not sleep last night. I want to use all this stuff. It is so weird. I just don't know what I'm going to do with it. <laughs> so could you imagine yeah after that only a few of his ideas actually made it into the mansion uh -huh. um like the the chair with the face on it or the wallpaper was actually originally his design and then uh, -huh. uh mark davis came in and altered it you know and redrew it all which is the face we see right now with the purple wallpaper right um but they you can see some of his other stuff in like disney world they have the um the wagon that was his idea also and that's out there it's just not all in the mansion anymore it's like just a few things that are actually still there but there's a comic book that came out from marvel called museum of the weird and it actually has uh, an uncle raleigh in the comic and it's oh no kidding raleigh Trump. yeah and they went to raleigh and said hey we want to use you in this comic is it okay if we use your ideas and raleigh crump's like Heck yeah, you can use all my stuff. I like being in comics. That'd be great. And so those Whoa, comics. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's five of them. And they have his ideas in it, like his. Wow. Sketches. I mean, redrawn by Marvel artists, but yeah, they're in there. So it, it, the stuff lived on, even though it was it's all these decades later. It, I mean, Haunted Mansion <sighs> opened in 1969, and the, the, the comics came out, I think it was 2012. Right. And Raleigh Crump okay. is still around. He still does artwork. Yeah. He still talks to people, does interviews. He has the CDs and the book out called It's Kind of a Cute Story, which is a really good oh, book. Oh, yeah. You hear his stories of the stuff he did. But it was the Haunted Mansion was just a huge collaboration between many different Imagineers. And Walt was the one who was figuring out what was going to go where and how it was going to meld together between comedy and horror. And he died. And nobody knew what to do. So they kind of mushed them together to fit how it is today. There was a lot of arguments, uh -huh. so to speak. Because, yeah. you know, they, everybody wanted their stuff to be in the mansion. And Walt wasn't there anymore to decide what would go in there. Right. There's so much stuff to talk about for Haunted Mansion and Pirates. So <laughs> much. Well, getting back to your book, could you tell us a little bit about Chapter 1? planning ahead yes so somebody had asked me it was i was still writing it and uh they said well what because people always email me or call me hey i'm going to disney now what should i do well oh my gosh there's like a whole book that talks about this stuff i would say um check the dates when you're going although now disneyland's kind of busy all the time now there's very few mm -hmm. downtimes for it when it used to be Oh, September is a really slow month, or February, March is our slow months, but not anymore. They're they're busy now all the time because the Halloween party is right. now like, all through September and October, and mm -hmm. every other day the park closes early for the the trick or treating, and now they have the Haunted Mansion holiday that carries over the first week of January, and so Haunted mm -hmm. Mansion is closed for two weeks in January, so. Really, the best time to go in the year is like the last two weeks of January. And that's yeah. that's about it. Because then every, people just go all the time. I mean, everybody complains about the prices going up. But when I first started going in 2001, it was $45 to get in. And they had a little over 14 million people that year. Last year, the tickets were up to $99. And 18.2 million people were in the park. 
Wow. Here. So the yeah. price doubled and it went up 4 million people. Crazy, huh? So everybody's saying, oh, I can't afford to go back to Disneyland. People are. An extra 4 million people can afford to go with $99. Now it's a 99, 109, 119, depending <laughs> on which day you go. Yeah. Yeah, they Unless have you the tiered over. the tiered pricing now. Yeah, exactly. Right. But that is, and I have to tell people that it is only for day one. Like if you're going for multiple days, you just get a hopper pass, and you don't have to worry about that. Which is why Disneyland is the only place you can buy a one day pass. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I tell people that check the weather, you know, so you know what type of clothing to wear, um, things to take into the park, like sunscreen. Your camera, camera batteries. Of course, when I wrote that was before everybody's cell phone became their, their camera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you're you have a single child and you're going as a family, like get a friend to go with them because kids have more fun when they they have somebody to share it with that's down on their level. Oh yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. stuff like that. Like yeah. how to find a good hotel. Mm -hmm. um, I always stay at a hotel that's within walking distance of the park. Um, or the parking structure. So if you're on Ball Avenue, you can just walk to the parking structure and take the tram in. Yeah. So it's just like little little bits of advice like that. Do you have any um, like tips um, as far as families go with with certain different places to eat, um, things that you prefer? Well, I had suggested the people to eat at the barbecue, and yeah. it was twenty four bucks a person, but now that's gone. Oh. Make way for Star Wars Land. Yeah. Um, I always recommend going to Blue Bayou at least once and wait for a water seat because that's the yes. best. Oh, yeah. Um, otherwise, you can take your own food in the park, which is mm -hmm. what I do. Take in sandwiches, take in pe uh, like peanut butter and jelly, trail mix, beef jerky, dried fruit, whatever you want. Yeah. Um, they didn't no used to allow you to do that. That's a changed policy. For years, they used to make you put it in the outside lockers and they had a little picnic area um right where the main gate was and if you brought food with you you had to eat outside the gate <laughs> yeah yeah they yeah, they don't do that anymore probably because so many people do it i mean they're making money off of them coming into the park mm -hmm. and the more money people have to buy things the better mm -hmm. so you know if they're not spending money getting a corn dog they're spending money getting souvenirs mm -hmm. um yeah. but i started going in 2001 and i've been able to take food in that that whole time no alcohol though and no hard sided ice chests if you do have one of those that's when they'll make you put it in a locker yeah that's the one that and they have those bigger lockers still right just outside yeah right outside the the gates that's over by where holiday land used to be back in the day <laughs> pre pre 1962 yeah long time ago oh my mm. word it's amazing New Orleans square kind of replaced it yeah. I mean, even the area between Pirates, what well, was between Jungle Cruise and mm -hmm. the Haunted Mansion? The Haunted Mansion used to be a fried chicken restaurant. And that whole area out there was grass and there was like a gazebo area and a bandstand. And in 1962, Walt brought Mark Davis over from animation and said, I need your help to make this Jungle Cruise funny because it's all serious and animals and oh. want funny scenes. So 1962, Mark Davis came up with the elephant bathing pool. And to add mm -hmm. that in, they had to reroute some of the river and make it wider. And they took out the gazebo area mm -hmm. to add in all those elephants. Yep. And the gazebo originally was located um, next to the castle. Right. Before that, it was located in Town Square. That was the magical traveling gazebo. <laughs> yeah, they move it. Isn't yeah. it over by the the uh, uh, Disneyland Hotel now? No, it's actually located. Um, uh, That's just a, a different few, gazebo. Yeah, they have it. Yeah, they have the gazebo actually still exists. They sold it to a. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they. I forget the name. I can't of remember the place, but. It's uh, about 20 miles away from Disneyland, I believe, somewhere in Orange County in, in a yeah. garden somewhere. Public yeah. Garden. I forget the Just name of it. Just can't remember where it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's people listening to the podcast yelling. They're, they're and, shouting it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do that when I listen to podcasts, too. Yeah. And somebody can't think of something. I know the answer, but this was pre-recorded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Could you share with us uh, more about Chapter 2, Upon Arrival? Well, when you get there, it just talks about um, w when you first go into the park, like the things you should do. Uh -huh. Peter Pan should be first. Peter Pan. It, that's oh. if you get there when the park opens. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to wait 45 minutes the entire day. Uh -huh. um, I, I list where stores are around the park. So if you need to um, go to Target or like for, if you forget sunscreen. I mean, nobody wants to spend $15 on sunscreen in the park. So right. there's a Target down the street. Now, this was also before smartphones and GPS was in it. And you could look <laughs> look for places by just <laughs> typing it in your phone. I listed all the gas stations, the little stores and stuff like that. I, it tell the good times to go into the park, like get there early. You can get there a half hour before the park opens, wait in line, and then you can go to the rope drop. And that's when you run to Peter Pan. The order to get your fast passes in which is also slightly different now because now they enforce the times. Yes, so they it's do. Just, it's, yeah, it's stuff like that. And like, um, you can ask to steer the Mark Twain riverboat and go up oh, top. You get I a certificate. did that once with my husband. That was amazing. Yeah, you get to ring the bell and uh -huh. toot the horn. Uh -huh. um, yeah, the guy let us take turns. And it was just, I mean, there's no experience to compare to that. Yeah, and you get when to pretend you're... like you're actually driving it. <laughs> yeah, it's not on the track. <laughs> and it's the thing people don't realize it how cool it is until you're up there because in the process of getting up there, you get to see an area that nobody gets to see. And not only that, but um, if you're used to going all the time and you hear those sounds and everything, you're so used to it. But when you're up there and you're handling the horn and the bell. And that's a part of somebody's magic for that day. That's a really emotional connection right there. Exactly. At least to me it was. Yeah. And they have a guest book so you can see other people who've been up there. Yeah. I took a picture of where he signed it. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask. Uh, they. I don't think they have it anymore, but you can ask a cast member at the exit for Haunted Mansion for a death certificate. I think they stopped that, though. I think so too. That's kind of morbid. <laughs> I, they yeah, had them online for a while on there, but I think yeah. they stopped those also. I'm not sure. You can go to doombuggies.com and get one. Oh, you they, still can? Yeah. They, they used okay. to give you a driver's license at Autopia too. Yeah, I haven't been there since they just reopened it. I don't know. It's a different um it's a different company that mm -hmm. yeah. sponsors it. So I yeah. don't know. Because it was Chevron with the I think Honda now took over. I think so, yeah. Maybe you can get a Honda driver's license. <laughs> but like, are the cars still cartoony? Like, are they going to have names and stuff? I don't know. They're they the, have the, the same cars. They just painted them differently. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. They were they were experimenting with the electric cars in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and I guess they didn't decide to do it here. I got to see one. They had a, a modified oh, yeah? one of the original cars that was modified to be electric. Because it was at the Disneyana convention in July, and mm. I was in—I had my table at the same. I was behind Bob Gurr, oh. and oh. he got up and he directed yeah. the car and was showing I him saw how to that. Park. <laughs> that was awesome. Like I went Wasn't up to it? Bob Gurr, introduced myself, and it was really cool to talk to somebody who made everything in Disneyland that moves: yep. the Doom buggies, the monorail, the Autopia cars, the the pirate ships that you ride on, Peter Pan, like. He made all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, I can't even imagine. The, the the little bit that I saw on video and pictures, I was just, you can't help but smile and just be so thrilled and tickle the pieces to watch him do things like that. Besides what you've already shared with us about pirates and the Haunted Mansion, in Chapter 3, you... Um, go into great detail about the history of Disneyland, and do you have a favorite aspect of the Magic Kingdom's history? Well, I, for one, the nickname of Disneyland was the Magic Kingdom mm -hmm. um, before they built Disney World, and started calling that Magic Kingdom, which is right. why the name of my book is Discovering the Magic Kingdom, an official Disneyland vacation guide. Well, part of it was I didn't research anything on Disney World because I didn't want to get information mixed up. And I'd never been to Disney World. I didn't know anything about it. And I didn't know that the actual name of the park there was Magic Kingdom. So yeah, that it was will kind mess of you up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
Well, I liked I like knowing that it all used to be orange trees and oh, I know that was beautiful grapevines. Yeah, and well, you, know, you can see pictures and video of Walt walking around through the dirt and measuring, and yeah, they have that that Disney myth about the trees getting marked with ribbons and the bulldozer being colorblind and knocking over the wrong trees. And that was actually started by, I want to say Marty Sklar. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Disney. Well, it was in a newspaper article and it was like, yeah, Yeah. the the bulldozer was colorblind and knocked over the wrong trees. And it just, it, it's just been a Disney myth ever since. Yeah. I don't know if it's true. It's not true. It's yeah. not. I didn't think so, but you yeah, know how you I, always I wonder. Ran, <laughs> yeah, I ran across an article that somebody had interviewed him at like a D23 event and asked mm-hmm. him about that. And he's like, oh, I, I kind of started the rumor. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Another fun fact, um, which I don't know if it's true or not, is they say they put um, uh, tags on the weeds when Disneyland first opened. To see which um, weeds to pull out? No, to so that people thought they were plants and not weeds. So they put like the names of what type of plant it was. Oh yeah. Because they didn't have <laughs> they didn't have enough to fill around the park. So they just left random plants and gave them names. Right. <laughs> yeah. They also That's used the creative. old Exactly. Well, they're imag- imagineers. Mm-hmm. They uh also used the old ripped up orange trees put planted them in the ground upside down for the the jungle crews to look right. like roots and stuff because they really didn't have anything a lot of the trees they were bringing in were adults but yeah it took it took like 60 years before the jungle cruise was its own ecosystem oh, right yeah if you look at the pictures from back then and now you can't even compare oh yeah not even that's, that's I, incredible yeah there's still one of the original trees the um it's called the Dominguez palm. It's what the yes. nickname that was given to it. It's a canary date palm tree. And it's mm-hmm. next to the fast pass distribution for Indiana Jones. And the best spot to see it from is when you come around the bend on Jungle Cruise before you exit. And you just look over by the building. It's just huge, tall palm tree. And it was planted in the late 1800s. It was an anniversary gift to the Dominguez family. Mm-hmm. But it used to be in a different part of the park over by where their um, house was. And they relocated right. it. Right. But then Wasn't they left that it. part of the original deal? They would sell their yes. property as long as they kept the tree. Yeah, there's some other original trees too. The um, eucalyptus trees behind uh, City Hall; mm-hmm. those were all planted in a row to block the wind for orange trees, and they're still there. If you look up old pictures, you can see how big the trees have grown since then. Yep. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to take a quick little break. And we'll be right back after these messages. Visit DisneyChris.com and experience the Disneyland Magical Audio Tour. A magical musical visit to the land where dreams come true. This amazing virtual tour of the happiest place on earth features hours of music found in over 1,200 audio tracks. Through this audio tour, you can navigate through the entire Magic Kingdom to experience and delight in the fun and adventure of a day at Disneyland from the comfort of your own living room. Every track has been re-edited, digitally enhanced, or remixed for an optimal sound experience. There are also hundreds of full-color photos and informative liner notes provided for each individual audio track. So have your e-tickets ready and come and experience the Disneyland Magical Audio Tour at DisneyChris.com. That's DisneyChris.com. Disney fans all over the world are learning about Magical Day Radio and the incredible guests we have, the topics we discuss, and, well, simply how magical it is. Magical Day Radio is the happiest show on the air, hosted by myself, John Short, and the amazing co-host that I have, Chris Linden. We interview Disney authors, voice talents, Imagineers, Disney icons, and even people who have actually worked with Walt Disney himself. Magical Day Radio airs on Wednesdays from 5 to 6 p.m. Pacific Time. To find out all the information, you can find the show page on Facebook by simply searching Magical Day Radio. Please give it a like and keep up with all the latest. Miss the Magical Day Radio Show? Well, no worries. You can find all of our archived shows on my YouTube channel now by simply searching my name, Don Short, on YouTube. 
Each show will be posted on Sundays as well as some new things to come from time to time. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. As always, we want to thank our listeners for all of your endless love and support. You make our time with you simply magical and we hope we add a bit of magic into your lives too. Well, we're back with uh, Joshua Schaefer, the author of Discovering the Magic Kingdom. So, Joshua, in Chapter 4, Things to Know Inside, which is by far the longest chapter, includes so many amazing points. Can you share with our listeners a few of these? So, um, I talk about how to use the, the photo pass, um, which is slightly different now because they can actually use your your pass as the photo pass. Um, I still have an old photo pass card because it's attached to my photo pass account. There's things you can do inside that, you know, just create good memories, especially if you have children, because these are the things that they'll remember growing up. Like if you have a churro, uh -huh. I mean, you can have churros anywhere, but for some reason they taste so much better in Disneyland, even though they cost. Don't four they? Times more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can go into the candy shop and they'll make fudge and, you can eat it like right after they make it. It's super fresh and soft and it's delicious. Yeah, they have and during Christmas time they have fresh candy canes too. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Limited 150 a day they make. And you have to go in the morning cool. and get a ticket. Yeah, yeah you do. Really That's popular. a goal of mine. If if I don't get one, I at least want to watch them make them. Yeah. I I've shared that video every Christmas on my fan page and it's it always gets a lot of views because yeah. it's really cool to watch them make it with all the melted sugar and mm -hmm. and I don't know it's a, it's a magical cane. <laughs> I is. have one. Someone got one for me when they were there, and I haven't eaten it. I don't think I could I, either. I don't want to break it. It's right? and it, they're big. <laughs> they're really big. You have to share it with three. Yeah, people. they're a huge. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to get a Dole Whip. Yes. Oh man, yeah. Get a dole up and sit and watch the tiki room because yeah. it was intended to be a restaurant originally. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so to sit there and eat while you're watching it's really cool. They just replaced all the chairs with benches um, a couple years ago. Before that, it was all the chairs that were originally bought for the restaurant for the right. tables. Right. That's why the tiki room is the only attraction that has a bathroom because it was or supposed to be a restaurant. Right. You should always go visit the partner statue and see Walt. Oh, definitely. He's the one that made the park. You can go visit the Petrified Tree, which is around the Rivers of America. There's a plaque there for the dedication from Lillian Disney, mm -hmm. which was actually, that was a Disney myth created by Walt. Because he did buy the Petrified Tree for the park, mm -hmm. but he was telling, he told people that he was getting it for Lillian as an anniversary gift and that she gave it to the park but actually it's he or he got it for the park um hmm. it was just funny for him to say it that way that it won't fit on their mantle because it's a big picture <laughs> fight for me. it's the I, oldest attraction in disneyland yeah i ran across yeah. a, an, an article <laughs> that had it had the letters that walt wrote to the it was by the national park the petrified forest and somebody had private property and he bought it from the person who owned the property. Oh, okay. And had it shipped to Disneyland. Um, everybody needs to try Mint Julep. Mm -hmm. That's you something I have not done yet. Oh, you oh, can sample it. Right. So can I try this? And they'll put it in a little Dixie cup. That's right. It's, it's very delicious. And I've posted the recipe on my fan page. Oh, cool. Yeah, you can... Um, you used to be able to ride in the caboose on uh, like the Lily Bell on the mm -hmm. train but now you have to be a club 33 member yeah to do it or during special tours mm -hmm. um like walk and waltz footsteps yes exactly yeah mm -hmm. when you're waiting in line for snow white you have to let the child touch the brass apple yes because then you can hear the the old hag cackle yeah. above you <laughs> uh -huh. right uh go to go to tomorrowland and visit the giant marble ball and mm -hmm. push it around. Mm -hmm. I like trying to change the direction of it, but when you go, there's always tons of kids. They love it. It's just it's, you know because it's water, so they get to play in water, and it's just giant marble ball. Yeah. Um, try to find 33 Royal Street. So walk around New Orleans Square and find it, and then realize you can't go in the door. <laughs> yeah, it's no longer the entrance. Yeah. No. Exactly. 
Then when you go on the sailing ship Columbia, you have to go below deck. I know it's exciting to be up above and see all the animatronics on shore, but below deck, they actually have a pirate galley down there. You can see how the pirates lived. They have beds set up. They have little... It's roped off um, when you're down there, but it's really cool to see all the pirate stuff. Mm -hmm. And they have a, a fish stew cooking on the... <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yummy. Do you have... Uh, I'm sure you do, but what are your top five favorite attractions in Disneyland? Oh, wow. Five, huh? Um, yeah, I'm always asking what's your number one. Let's see. Number one, Pirates. Number two, Haunted Mansion. Number three, uh, Tiki Room. Number four, Jungle Cruise. And number five, probably Indiana Jones. Cool. Nice. And I love the new special effects that they added into Indiana Jones with the projections. It's awesome. Yeah. I still think that they the projections that they're using, like on the face of Mara, they need to use projections like that for that that ghost that flies toward you when you go through one of the caves. And all the it's just a it's a printed it's like printed on see through material. So it looks like there's a ghost with neon, you know, it's neon paint. Mm -hmm. And it's um I think it's right after you see the snake. But I'm like, why can't they make that a projector and have it moving toward you? Like that would be so easy to add in. I don't but even it's just remember a, that. Yeah, I don't I'm trying remember to that think. part of it. I That's you it's when you're inside the skull with the, the okay. big skull that shoots the like the laser beams from its eyes. Mm -hmm. Like you're down inside it and you have rah, and they they have this it's it's neon paint. Hmm. And it it looks like it's coming toward you, like a okay. like a ghost demon. Really? Wow. Yeah. I have to pay I'll attention to next time. <laughs> I don't think I ever noticed that. Yeah. There's so much to look at when you're in there. <laughs> I know. And I know, I'm right? Clinging to the <laughs> steering wheel like yeah. scared half to death. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any other must do's when you go to the park that we haven't mentioned yet? You have to watch the fireworks. Oh yeah. If you haven't already. Once you've seen them and you're on your that same trip. That's the time to go on some of the attractions that have longer wait times. Yeah, that's um, what my sister and I used to do. Yeah, because that's when everybody's watching the fireworks. Mm -hmm. And they're not at the attractions. We had, we had this one experience. It was completely by accident. Um, it's back when the, the rockets were above the people mover station. Yes. And we... Could not remember the last time he went on them. And so we decided we were going to go on up. This is back when they still had the uh, the ticket books, I believe. And wow. so we went up there and uh, went on it. And we're like, isn't it about time for the, the fireworks? I'm like, yeah, well, we got on there, um, sat in one together. And I'll be doggone if the fireworks didn't go off while we were in the jets. And that was one of the coolest things we had experienced together that's neat it was it was super neat especially when you're higher up to see them because there's nothing blocking your view like there the was nothing yeah, yeah and it was just me and her and nowadays it's it's different because they have projections on the castle and lasers and fog and <laughs> snow that they add into the fireworks show so you kind of have to be on main street now to really enjoy the full they yeah. even have projections show. on the buildings of Main Street itself. Yeah, so. yeah, that too. And oh, and on, on Small World, they do it on Small World too. Oh, that's right. You don't know where in the heck to stand. I also have um, ghost stories listed. Now, these I got from people who experienced them, so they're not actually my experiences. Okay. Um, like when they've seen things move or ghostly outlines. Okay. Especially in Haunted Mansion, there's um, there's a story that goes along with Tim, who's the ghost that haunts the Haunted Mansion and Pirates. Is his mom dumped his ashes, and he just stayed. And it it's true, like they people dump ashes on Haunted Mansion all the time, mm -hmm. and I've heard cast members talk about this, and they say that when they have to go through with the lights on and clean it up, they just see a pile of ashes and sweep it oh. up, and it goes into the garbage can. So it's like, here's my, you know, my family's <laughs> remains. And they're like, no, it's going to the garbage can. 
I can't it even looks, imagine. Yeah, well, I mean, you think of the Haunted Mansion as like, oh, it's this dark place and nothing's here. and But no, they turn on the lights to clean and mm-hmm. you can see it all. So <laughs> yeah, don't dump your ashes on Haunted Mansion. No. no. Yeah. Then if you get caught, that's a good way to never be able to come back again. Yeah, they'll make you leave. Yes, yeah. forever. Um, I also have the the incidents listed, like all the people that died in the park. Yeah, there's right. been a few. Been a Twelve few tragic incidents. Yeah, there's like almost almost a billion people have gone to Disneyland, and twelve people have died. One of them was a cast member, mm-hmm. um, and I it was a cast member. It was on America Sings. Yeah, and it was before they had the safety breakaway walls, and she mm-hmm. got crushed by two walls. Yeah, um, there's people who are like hiding out on Tom Sawyer Island and trying to swim back across and drown in the shallow water. Like, they're all stupid guests, pretty much <laughs> walking in on the monorail track. Um, oh yeah, that's yeah. not too like, right. Yeah, like what? What are people thinking? standing up on the on the Matterhorn? Matterhorn, Dolly's mm-hmm. dip. Yeah, they have Dolly's yeah. dip on the Matterhorn. She took off her seatbelt to deal with her kids i guess and she fell out and there's the the nickname for the people mover was the people remover because two people died on that <laughs> oh my mm. word <laughs> and because of its secluded area it got the nickname of the people maker because of teenagers oh yeah <laughs> adventure through inner space had a similar name which i cannot repeat yes. on this podcast yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> just i just heard about imagination the inner space <laughs> 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 okay, so Joshua, you've also included information about Disneyland California Adventure in your book. What are your favorites there as far as attractions, shows, etc.? Oh, I love Cars Land now because it, mm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. You go go there right when the sun's going down and you can watch them turn on the lights. And yes. it's Gorgeous. even if the, even if the line's an hour long for Radio Springs Racers, it's worth the wait. Um, there's hidden Mickeys all over that land. All the hoods that are in the shop window, the car hoods, huh. there's a little hidden Mickey on each one of those somewhere. They're they're built into the walls. There are hidden Mickeys everywhere because everybody loves finding the hidden Mickeys. Oh, yeah. Which I have a whole hidden Mickey section in my book, by the yep. way. There's about 117 of them listed in there. Um, let's see. I, I like The Little Mermaid. I know it's a simple. It was one of the newest dark rides added in. But I like the way the animatronics are moving. And they had to change Ariel because mm-hmm. her original hair, they called it the Dole Whip hair because yeah. it looked like a swirl. But that's <laughs> how did. it looks in the movie. Like I'd posted a blog and I had a picture from the movie, a picture of the attraction, and her hair looked just like it. But people didn't get that. So they changed it to appease people. It was only like that for about four months when it first opened. And um, right at that scene, if you turn around and look behind your shell, you mm-hmm. can see. The Incredible Mr. Limpet. I know. Which was so played cool. by Don Knotts in the movie. Do you know why they have him there? I don't. Well, he's he was actually in the movie, in The Little Mermaid, 1989. Um, they put him in the movie because the animator that worked on the film, The Incredible mm-hmm. Mr. Limpet, I'm trying to remember his name right now. Uh, that was the last film he did before he passed away. Now, it wasn't Disney but he was a Disney animator and director. And so to honor him, because he had oh. died in the late 80s, they, they put the Mr. Limpet in The Little Mermaid. Oh, so I love they, that story. Same thing for the attraction. Right. Yes, and so they added in there too. It makes you love Disney even more when you hear things like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that I have, I have more of an emotional attachment to some of these attractions now because of all the stuff I learned about it. Like you learn about Walt and the last things he did for Pirates of the Caribbean, you're like, man, he had like everything tied into this. Yeah. And people you don't just, realize. Yeah, and you feel bad because he didn't get to see it, and yeah. you know, like his legacy will live on. And now the Pirates is the standard for what makes a good Disney Disney ride because mm-hmm. that was Walt's last input. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They almost didn't want to complete stuff because they're like Walt's not here to approve it and they had um there was a parrot sitting by the pirate the one with his leg dangling off the bridge 
uh-huh. who was voiced by Existencio, by the way. Um, and he th- he kept moving. They kept moving the parrot around because they didn't know exactly where they wanted it. And they're like, just put it someplace. <laughs> I know you don't want to complete it because Walt's not here to approve it, but you, we have to decide where to put it. So, yeah, it's it's fun to learn this stuff. It really is. Can you tell us about your limited edition Disney pins that you are creating? Oh, my fantasy pins. Oh, my word. They're gorgeous. Oh, thank you. I, <laughs> I, just started, I actually just learned about fantasy pins earlier this year. Now, Disney, uh, fantasy pin is a pin made by a fan, which is how it got its name, fantasy pin. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not made by Disney. They can't be traded in the park or with cast members. But artists will... They, they will just have the characters like they want them to be. They'll draw them either interacting with each other, like put Stitch on Haunted Mansion or have Belle dress like someone from Harry Potter. Like you can have crossovers. You can do them however you want. And so I wanted to do a Zootopia pin because at the time, Zootopia had just come out and it was my new favorite Disney movie. And... I came up with the idea. I drew it on Photoshop, sent it into a pin company, went through three pin companies before I finally got it right. And I finally got it. The movie's kind of died down a little bit. Um, but now I'm working on other ones. I'm trying going to try to get a new one out at least every five weeks or so. Wow. And the, my current one is Stitch and BB-8. Oh, which are yeah. T- two of my favorite characters. Well, and now I have it on t-shirts too. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah, I didn't even plan on it. I someone had suggested it to me because um, there's like um, tpublic.com. You just look up Stitch and BB-8, and you can have it printed on a T-shirt, and they're really cheap too. Mm-hmm. But um, I should be getting that pin in in a couple weeks, and then I can send them out because I have a bunch of pre-orders. Very, and cool. it's really fun because you get to you get to have your characters exactly how you want them to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially especially crossovers because you don't Disney doesn't really do that. I mean, yeah. they'll have Stitch doing different things because he was the original crossover character. If you remember when the trailer came out, the, all mm-hmm. the trailers and they had Stitch interrupting all the Disney characters in their movies to yeah. promote Lilo and Stitch. And so it makes sense for Stitch to cross over. Um, but yeah, it's fantasy pin. Um, I mean, I have it listed on my Etsy account. Um, just look up DTMK for discovering the magic kingdom fantasy pins. So DTMK fantasy pins on Etsy. Um, they can go to my fan page, discovering the magic kingdom. Like I also have the links listed there as well. Same thing for the t-shirts. Yeah, but it's fun. I I've had fun doing those and I have all these other ideas I'm working on too. I just gotta. So it's an ongoing project. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And yeah. I get excited when I come up with a new idea and start drawing it and then just set it oh, to the I side. Can imagine. I don't want to spend too much time doing it because I have other things to work on, like my book. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I start drawing the pictures just so that I can remember what I had wanted when I came up with the idea. Well, we're super excited to, mm-hmm. to hear what comes next for you. Um, and where can people um, find you next? Well, actually, next Saturday. I will be at Barnes and Noble on Lone Tree Way in Antioch, which is in the same uh, shopping center as Target, at okay. six o'clock at night. So August twentieth at six o'clock, I'll be there signing books, um, which is exciting for me because this is my first big chain bookstore. Wow! Yeah, I've always done mom and pop bookstores, but now my book has returnability, so actual bookstores can have it and. That was exciting. I mean, to see my book on a shelf in a big chain bookstore, I went and took a selfie with them. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) It was great. And if they want to get a copy of my book online, they can just go to discoveringthemagickingdom.com. It's listed on there. You can just Google my name, Joshua Schaefer. And I show up. I'm the first picture you see on Google when you type in my name. It's kind of cool to see that. And then you can see all my, I post fun facts on there all the time. Um, Unless I'm super busy and can't get to it. But I try to. I have an Instagram under Disney Guides. And I post fun facts on there all the time. And I just like getting the information out there. Can people find you on Twitter or Facebook? Uh, The Facebook is Discovering the Magic Kingdom. Um, It's my fan page. Uh, I'm not on Twitter. 
So just pretty much Instagram, Facebook, Etsy. Well, we definitely want to thank our special guest, Joshua Schaefer, for joining us. Thank you so, so much. And we'll have to have you back. And um, we're looking forward to the new book and anything else that you have coming up. Thank um, you. Make sure, oh, you're welcome. Make sure you <laughs> check out um, all of his pages and his Etsy store, everything that you can. He's going to have some new stuff coming out, guys. So keep an eye out for that. As always, you want to thank everyone for listening to Magical Day Radio and remind you to please check out our Facebook show page under Magical Day Radio. Please give it a like for us. We will post updates on the show, Disney news, and anything we come across to share with you as well as our archived shows. Magical Day Radio's archived shows can be found on my YouTube channel each Sunday simply by searching my name, Dawn Short. Please subscribe to the channel and keep up with the shows and more to come. Again, links will be on the Facebook show page for easier access. You can find both Chris and I on Twitter as well. Chris, did you want to share your contact with everyone? You can find me on Twitter at DisneyChris73 and on Facebook under the name Chris Linden, L-Y-N-D-O-N. And my Twitter is simply Dawn, double underscore short. Um... Uh, should you wish to contact either one of us, please use the message feature on the Facebook show page, and I'll get back with you right away. And as always, we want to thank all of our listeners for your continued love and support. Because of you, our time spent here is simply magical, and we hope that you've had a magical day, too. Good night, everybody. This has been Magical Day Radio with your hosts, Don Short and Chris Linden. This was a Dragus Production syndication. Magical Day Radio was created by host, public relations, and social media director, Don Short. Designs, websites, and sounds created by host and graphic design producer, Chris Linden. Magical Day Radio is not associated with the Walt Disney Company, its affiliates, or subsidiaries. All copyrighted media is used under journalistic fair use for commentary and educational purposes only. Please join us on Facebook at Magical Day Radio. Thanks for listening and have a magical day.